All right. <sighs> well, it's nice to be back. Um, I was really lucky to have the chance to come here in late September, not only to Tallinn, but also to uh, speak to this group. Uh, just for my information, how many people were at Dev Club at the end of September when I was here last? Okay, good. So thanks for coming back. I guess that means that my performance was okay, otherwise you probably would skip tonight. Um, last time um, I made the presentation very open and just started asking questions and then answered them. Um, and I thought if I try to do this again, the problem is that probably I will answer the same questions and if half of you saw it last time you don't need to see it again. So uh, tonight one of the things that I'd like to do is to move away a little bit from the more hardcore design and programming uh, topics and talk about something that I think will be uh, a little bit uh, more interesting or has become more interesting to programmers over the last few years as sort of the lean startup has become more and more common. Now when I was here last I talked a little bit about uh, where agile software development comes from. And so the short version is we're all familiar with the waterfall cycle, right? So you start, I shouldn't even say cycle because it's not a cycle, but um, where we start with analysis and then we do design and then we code and then we write tests and then we maintain or deploy. And I had shown how you could take this uh, single pass waterfall and with one simple idea, you can turn it into um, what we know as feedback-driven agile software development. I won't go through the whole detail now. But what happens is that you can take this really simple idea and show how there are going to be cycles. So when we put a cycle here, it becomes test-first programming. And then when we put another cycle here, that becomes test-driven development. And when we put another cycle here, this becomes behavior-driven development. And when we put another cycle here, this whole thing becomes continuous delivery. The last part of the puzzle, though, has to do with this. It has to do with where the money comes from. And so in traditional waterfall-style development, you have uh, this group of people who wear very expensive suits, who argue about hundreds of thousands or millions of euro every so often and once per year if you're lucky you get enough money to run your project and that's where the money comes from right because at the beginning before we even ask the question what are the requirements and what's the design and all that the question is what where is the money going to come from and how do we know that we're going to generate enough money back well, it turns out that if we add one more feedback cycle here, then we essentially create the lean startup. That the idea of the lean startup really has as its core using tests as a way not only to decide if the code is okay, not only to decide if the design is okay or if we have the right requirements or if it works in production, but will somebody buy it? And so this idea of lean startup really has at its core the notion that we can use tests, we can actually challenge our ideas about will a product be profitable, and we can start to test that out before we even build it. Now this isn't going to be a talk about lean startup. This is going to be about the talk about what happens if you survive the first six months. The first six months of a lean startup can be quite chaotic. Our goal is to do the absolute minimum that we can to try to stay alive for another day. Or maybe if we're lucky to stay alive for another week. Do we still have enough energy to pursue this project? Do we have enough determination to see how far we can go? Let's assume that now we've reached, that we've reached the first point where the six of us in the room or the four of us in the room agree 
that this project is worth spending more time on, that we're willing to make this a three-year or a five-year commitment, that we're going to try to build a business. What happens to the software? So product sashimi is... Let's try that again. Product sashimi is one part of this equation. It's one part of the what do we do after we've got started. This, I propose this, this is distilled from various ideas in uh, agile user story writing, agile product development, agile product design, uh, a bunch of these ideas that I've sort of brought together combined with a little bit of my own experience and with the programmer's point of view. Because I think one of the biggest problems these days with sort of the agile, com not the community, but with the agile books and ideas, it, especially as agile becomes more and more of an enterprise idea, that we still have missed the fact that the key point in agile software development is for business and technical people to work together. That the collaboration part of agile software doesn't just mean that programmers work with other programmers and testers work with other testers and product owners work with other product owners. That really where the magic starts to happen, where we start to really eliminate a bunch of unnecessary work and cut through to the heart of the sort of efficiency that agile uh, software development tells us what there will be is when business and technical people work more closely together. Now there's one big problem between business and technical people. They speak completely different languages. In some cases, literally. And I don't just mean when the people with the money in London yell orders to the people in Bucharest who do the programming. I even mean that even if we're in the same room, we prefer to talk in concepts about software design. We prefer to talk in code. We prefer to talk in bits. We prefer to talk in XML. God help us. Uh, if we're lucky, we get to talk in more interesting languages, right? Like Smalltalk, like, uh, I don't know, Python, Ruby. And we don't always have to talk in C++ and Java. They have no idea what any of this stuff means. Or if they did, they knew 20 years ago or 15 years ago. So they might know what C means, but there's a reason why they now wear the suits. That they're more interested in the business aspect of things. They're more concerned with market share, ROI, cash on cash return. They're more concerned with what's the payback period, what's the compounding period, what's the earned value on the project so far. And so because we speak fundamentally different languages, any help that we can have on how to work together uh, will definitely be beneficial. We definitely need it. Product sashimi help hopes to help business people and technical people do a better job of exploring products together. So we're not really going to talk that much about raw business. We're not going to talk that much about financial terms, but we are going to try to, what I'm going to propose is a, a, a technique and a set of techniques for providing better collaboration between business and technical people on exploring products. Once you get past the first six months and you figured out the first four features that have got 300 people to give you 50 euro for a year, how do we keep this going? We know that there's 200 wonderful features that we want to build. We know we can't afford to build them all, and we certainly can't plan, or we can't afford to plan to build them all. How do we know which ones are going to give us the most return on investment? We don't know. How can we arrange things so that we have the best chance of success? Now, uh, those of you who have read books like Mike Cohn's User Stories Applied, or his Agile Estimating and Planning, or some of the other books on this topic, um, some of the work by Jeff Patton on user story mapping, there's going to be some overlap with that stuff. There's, some, there's a bunch of things in there that I agree with and use and enjoy, and there's some things that I do a bit differently. So really what you'll get here is sort of my 
um, let's say, my perspective on how to turn ideas for products into working software. And that really is the goal. The goal here is we have this big cloud, which is the mechanism for building software. And in here are feature requests. And out here are running tested features, right? All three parts are important, right? We, we need this software to run. It needs to actually do something. It can't just be diagrams on a page. It can't just be ideas in, someone head, in someone's head. It needs to be tested. We need to know that what we did is what we should have done, that the, the software does what we think it should do. And features, meaning that what it does, needs to provide value to users. It needs to provide enough value that people are willing to pay for it. And so product sashimi is not necessarily about the entire route, but is more about which feature requests should come in. The nice thing about this diagram is that it helps us use things like theory of constraints to really sort of reverse engineer all the ideas in XP, Lean, Kanban, Scrum, and so on. But how do we know which features to work on and in which sequence, and how much, and when? A lot of this is kind of an exercise left to the reader. That's what I want to talk about tonight. So the overall diagram, the overall picture, kind of looks like this. Up here, this is the nebulous product idea. This is just some vague notion in someone's head. I want to, I want, I wish I had software that did X. You know, there's this great, we've all seen like the Dilbert mission statement generator, right? Where you can go on the web and you can push a button and get this ridiculous sounding mission statement that probably is in some company's book somewhere. Just throws together random bullshit words and somehow it turns into something. Well, it turns out that there's actually a lean startup product generator. And because every lean startup product is similar, it, it actually has a similarity to every Hollywood movie. Every Hollywood movie is two other movies that have already been made put together. Right? So that's essentially it. Every, every movie that you've seen, probably 95% of them, you could say, well, that's just like, that's, you know, Jaws if it was a dog. You know, that's the idea. Well, the Lean Startup Generator is, uh, is to take an existing product and another problem and put them together. So it's like TripIt, but for movies, right? It's like Facebook for surgeons. That's the idea. That's what every Lean Startup, when you go to a venture capitalist, that's about as much as you have. That's the nebulous product idea. I don't know very much about it, but I know it's going to be a uh, trip it for expense reports. I, I, this is all I can think of. Now, the nebulous product idea, let me just write this up here. The nebulous product idea might be enough to get you a little bit of money to get started, whether it's your own money or someone else's. Pretty soon, you need to start to break this down into something more concrete. And so one of the next stages are essentially feature areas. Well, if it's trip it for expense reports, then I need I need some chunk that's going to make it easy to actually generate the final report so I can get reimbursement. Then I need another part that um, uh, allows me to um, handle the fact that I'm going to have expenses in multiple currencies and so I need a part that handles currency exchange and makes sure that it does that correctly. And I need another part that's sort of the workflow so that companies can manage the workflow of their expense reports to say which one needs to be sent to whom for approval and what happens next. And I need another part in here, the trip it part, the really cool part, is you just take a photo of your receipt and you send it to our email address and we parse the receipt for you. That's how it's trip it for expense reports. 
You don't even have to enter the information. We have this database of receipts, so we know what they look like from a bunch of major companies, and 80% of the time we can guess what the receipt actually has on it. So these are all these little feature areas. They're still relatively not well understood, but they are a little bit more, uh, they're a little bit more well understood than this nebulous product idea. Now traditionally, and it seems funny to say traditionally when talking about agile projects, just kind of, it's, it's actually nice to be able to say that this stuff has been around for about 15 years and now we can say traditionally in agile, traditionally in agile, the centerpiece has been the story, right? This is what we've, uh, we've read a whole bunch of books on this stuff. We've read a whole bunch of articles that people have written. And so we have these beautiful cards that came from extreme programming that are the, you know, what's, what's a story card? It's a token for a conversation. It's like now this has become the liturgy. This has become part of the canon of the religion of Agile. And so we know that a, you know, this, these are the sacred tokens of conversation and that you know, you, thou shalt not write all detail on the card but shall retain it so that when you have the chance to talk to the business person then they know what to talk about. This is the idea. And stories have kind of been the centerpiece of the way that we manage projects. Um, it, it, the only reason it is this way is because it was this way once in the 1990s in Detroit because their specific set of problems led them to the conclusion that we need cards that are enough to remind us what we're supposed to do but not so much that people start writing thousands of words of documentation. That was their specific problem. Um, I'll call these features, you can call them stories, whatever you like. And as I said, traditionally this has been the centerpiece of planning in Agile software projects. It's, in fact, as we've been teaching people how to try to do some kind of Agile software development, this is where they have the most problems. This is where they have the most fights. This is where they have the most misunderstandings. Well, why do I have to use cards? Can't I use a spreadsheet? Well, what does the spreadsheet look like? What should the columns in the spreadsheet be? Who can update the spreadsheet? Who can read the spreadsheet? Somebody has to update the spreadsheet at the meeting. Now we have to pull up the spreadsheet. Oh, we're, who's going to type into the... And it just goes on and on and on. Is this a one? Is it a two? Is it a three? No, those are stupid. Let's try t-shirt sizes. Extra large, large, medium, small. Well, what about somebody like me who needs three extra large? Maybe I'm too big to build? So. As much as we've been trying and done some good work on user stories over the last 15 years, it's still a major source of confusion for a lot of projects. And as I've been trying to help people do this stuff well, I've kind of realized that maybe this is a little bit of a dead end, that maybe this isn't the place to go next. So um, in 2002, now I get to tell my obligatory history lesson, right? I have gray in here, which means I get to say old things. In 2002, Ward Cunningham, the father of the wiki, and by the way, if you don't know what that means, then you need to go and just Google Ward Cunningham, and it, because of him, we have Wikipedia today. Um, whether that's a benefit or not, I'm not sure, but... Uh, Ward Cunningham presented this neat idea at the Agile conference in 2002, which I'm straining to remember where that was. That was actually in Lincolnshire, Illinois, not even Chicago, an annoying suburb of Chicago that's hard to get to. We had this great workshop on functional testing tools, back when we used to call it functional testing. Right? In the old days, we used to say there were unit tests, and there were functional tests. And the unit tests checked little parts of the application and functional tests checked big parts of the application. Um, and so this functional testing workshop was talking about what is the latest and greatest tools and techniques and ideas in functional testing. Back then when we said functional testing, really we meant what eventually started to become known as customer testing which then started to be known as scenarios or you know, business facing tests, these kinds of things. The tests that help the customer feel comfortable that the feature we're selling them really exists. 
So at that time, Ward shared uh, this idea that he called FIT, the Framework for Integrated Testing. And the idea behind FIT was really simple. He said, business people know spreadsheets. They know tables. When they write documents about features, often they'll have calculation tables or they'll have decision tables. And often they're, they're really good with Excel. At least the good ones are. What if we programmers allowed them to write their tests with Excel and then we would run those tests against our program? And the in Excel, the cells were turned red when the answer was wrong and green when the answer was right. Seemed like a pretty reasonable thing to do. He also said that as he had started doing this, one cool thing, because Ward always has one cool thing to tell you, the cool thing was if you zoom way out and look at the spreadsheet, you can look at the patterns of the green and red cells and those patterns provide information. If the green and the red all seems quite random, that might tell you, that might not tell you much. But you'll start to see patterns that this group of cells, the green and red, is in the same pattern as these group of cells. And it's again in these group of cells down here, which probably tells us that there are certain kinds of mistakes that we keep making. Or there are certain kinds of ideas in the product where the business people and the technical people don't quite understand each other. Let's work harder here. So we all kind of said, yeah, sounds kind of cool. Why don't you tell us more about it next year? And then by 2004, there was a book on the topic. Around the same time, the folks at Object Mentor started to said, well, if Fit is good and Wiki is good, let's put them together. They called it Fitness. I used it for a number of years and found it really helpful that anyone could go edit the page, change the test, save it, run, and see if it worked. In fact, I spent some time uh, working with the professional baseball team in the city in which I lived in Toronto. Uh, kind of nice for a baseball fan to get to sort of, you know, work with their home team. It's, uh, it's every sports person's dream to get a chance to work with their home team. And uh, we were using fitness as a way to share information about the product I was building. Now, my customer is a scout. Scouts in baseball, uh, especially if they're scouting amateur players, have to travel all around the US, Latin America, and South America looking for new players. And they especially like to go outside the US because the young players in the US expect to make a lot of money and the young players who are like 16 years of age who live in Central America are just happy if you give them shoes. So obviously they are good ones to go after. It's literally true. Um, plus you can sign them when they're 16 years old whereas the Americans expect to go to college, they expect you to wait for them, blah blah blah. So he traveled a lot. He had his home office in Boston. Of course he worked with the team in Toronto so he had an office there. He had another office in Texas, and then he would travel around. So he wasn't always there. You know, talk about on-site customer. I didn't exactly have it. What we did, though, is we used fitness to write our business tests, our customer tests, which was the word that I tended to use back then. And one night, Keith, my customer, woke up at 3 o'clock in the morning, and for some stupid reason, at that moment, he remembered that he made a mistake. That there was something he forgot to tell me about a feature that we already thought we finished. Now, if that happened to you or in your company, what would probably happen? He would try to write some email, probably still half asleep. And when you're half asleep and you're writing an email, then 150 words becomes 2,000 words. So then he would press send, and he would kind of go back to sleep. Around 9, 30, 10 o'clock in the morning, I would get the email, and I have no idea what the hell he's trying to tell me. So I probably spend 30 minutes trying to understand it. I know I can't call him because he's probably flying somewhere. So then I would have to send an email back saying, I think this is what you're trying to tell me. And probably it would take three or four emails back and forth before I finally knew what the hell he's talking about. 
Now I finally have enough information to go back to the system and try to first verify that it is in fact wrong. Then send it back an email saying, okay, yes, it's wrong. What should it be? Two or three more emails back and forth. It takes another two days. Finally, I know what I'm supposed to do. I build it. I test it. And then I tell him it's done. That took eight days. Here's what happened instead. He went online. He visited the website. He edited the page. He added two rows to a table. He saved it, he pressed run. The cells were already green. He sent me an email that said, I added a couple of rows to this page. Good news, it already works. Good night. And he went back to sleep. Eight days, 10 minutes. So I was sold that this was a really good idea. And in fact, this was the first time that I had seen working in this style really make a big difference. Now. The website, that it was a wiki, helped, right? He could edit it himself, and uh, he knew how to add a couple of rows to the table. He knew what it meant. He could press run, run it against the system. Everything seems fine, and that was cool. But really, what the part of that that makes it the most powerful, the part that makes it the most beneficial for working between business people and technical people was the fact that we were writing in tables and that each row of that table was an example. Now, it's a very simple word example, but the sort of the path that we took to get to the point of calling it examples was quite long, right? We first we called them functional tests, then we started to call them customer tests. Then Brian Merrick said, no, 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 we have uh, business and technical tests and we have design and product tests and blah, blah, blah. And then we started to talk about two camps at the same time. One started to call them examples and the other started to call them scenarios. And now because cucumber is becoming more popular, more people are calling them scenarios. An example is just that. It's a test that doesn't sound like a test. And because it doesn't sound like a test, business people are paying attention. Because that's all a test is. A test, for we programmers, when we write a test in J unit, in N unit, whatever, it's really just an example of how to use our objects. Right? If you look at the documentation for a library or a framework, I don't know about you, my favorite libraries are the ones whose documentation includes examples of how to use the code. If you do this, then this will be the output. About three or four years ago, the very first book from Manning Publications, Lucene in Action, if you don't know what Lucene is, don't worry. This was the first programming book that was about technology, where the samples in the, in the book were JUnit tests, not type this in and you will see 12, but were actual JUnit tests that you could copy them, paste them in, run them with the JUnit test runner and see them pass. Obviously there's something to it, to this idea of speaking in examples. And so what I have found over the last, since I worked on that project oh, nine years ago now, is that everywhere I go when I work with product owners, business analysts, uh, VPs, that if we're having difficulty understanding what the system should do, that as soon as I say, let me give you an example, or please give me an example, the conversation gets interesting and valuable right away. And so rather than thinking in terms of stories or features, I actually encourage people to jump right to thinking in terms of examples. Now. Examples are, of course, smaller. We need more of them in order to do the same thing we can do with stories. So you'll have, for every feature, a number of examples. Not necessarily a small number either. But in every feature, there's usually one, sometimes two, key examples. That if you understand those examples, 
The rest is just details. The rest is just variations. The rest is just programmers being overly paranoid or business people perhaps being overly ambitious. There's usually a, a couple, one or two key examples for each feature area that captures the important ideas about that feature idea, or feature area, excuse me. And so, I think it's fairly obvious that, generally speaking, we'll move in the direction from a nebulous product idea to feature areas. This is the way I think most people think. It would be nice to be able to go from the big thing to the small things, but I think that, generally speaking, our brains are just not that powerful and not that well organized. Our thinking is messier than that. But whereas a lot of uh, books will suggest going from feature areas to features or stories, I actually don't teach that anymore. I suggest instead to go from feature areas directly to examples. And especially to try to find these key examples, the ones in blue here, the, the ones that are the essence of the feature area. Once we start to write these, and as we understand what's going on here, then we start to move back in the direction of features. Features, or stories, just become convenient bundles of examples. And instead of spending all our time worrying about whether we're getting the stories right, are the stories the right level of granularity? Are they too big? Are they too small? Why do I keep writing the same four stories for every feature? Why does every story look the same? Instead of all this stuff, which I think really boils down to just, you know, if you organize the stories that way instead of that way, it would be much clearer. I prefer to talk directly in terms of examples. And then because there are like 3,000 of these, it's kind of inconvenient to talk about them individually. It then might be convenient to take these seven and refer to them by one card, and these six and refer to them by one card, and these three and refer to them by one card. Or it might turn out that after we've built two or three parts of the system, that in fact it's these five that should be treated as a single bundle and these four that should be treated as a single bundle, and not the way we originally thought we would organize them. So, at the high level, the, the big idea with product sashimi is to move from the nebulous product idea to feature areas, and then specifically right to examples. As we start to build the examples, this is where the important conversations happen. This is where the big collaboration starts to happen between business people and technical people. Because in order to write good examples, the technical people know how to write good examples because they know how to write tests. And examples are tests that just don't sound like tests. They're, they're tests that business people can understand. They're tests that are sort of phrased in the ordinary language of users rather than in the details of classes and objects and functions and methods and variables. Do you still use stickers? You absolutely can. And in fact, the tool, to me, the choice of tool really isn't important. Whether we express these examples as free text or as tables, I think just depends on the specific example. So if you're talking about a workflow, a workflow is probably more easily described like a script, just a bunch of lines in a row. And therefore might fit sort of the cucumber feature a little bit better, the, the cucumber style or gherkin style. But also remember that, you know, do fixture in the fit library would do kind of the same thing. It's just that you still have these weird column breaks. Whereas a lot of examples are more like calculations. Right? The first three columns are inputs, the last two columns are the expected output. There's some function that combines three, these three pieces of information to create those two pieces of information, and a table works much better. And it wasn't long after Cucumber started to become popular that we started to add tables into Cucumber. Because we knew that there were just some kinds of examples where tables are better than scripts. And so what we've learned, I think, in trying to write these examples is that we need a mixture of scripts and tables, and that those two tools together can pretty much help us write whatever kind of test we want to write, whatever kind of example we want to write. 
So these days when I'm working on projects, I actually tend to use Cucumber more, just because that's the cool tool to use. But if my customer was six time zones away, fitness would be an excellent choice. There must be a way, must be an easy way to make Cucumber available on a wiki. So to me, this is where really all the magic happens. There's some cool stuff that goes on here. But really in the, in the uh, uh, process of exploring feature areas and writing examples, this is the most painful part and it's also the most valuable part of the entire process. And then if you want to bundle these examples into features this way or that way or that way or that way, be my guest. Do what makes you happy. Or you might decide that in one feature area, it's enough just to create the two key examples and then leave the rest as details for two months from now, three months from now. Can you give some <coughs> example of these examples? I absolutely will. I'm not going to do it just this second, but I absolutely will. Um, but that, I tell you, could you give me an example of is the most important phrase that we as programmers can use when dealing with business people, whether they're product owners, business analysts, or actual business people. People who actually, you know, sometimes some of us are lucky enough to get to work with clients who actually run that business. Not clients who have heard of people who know how to run that business. As internal enterprise product owners often are. You know, it's funny, uh, the original, one of the early stories about on-site customer had to do with a company that was building software um, for gas stations. And they decided that the best way to get a good customer was to hire a retired gas station manager. They just paid him $60,000 a year, which hell, he was retired, so that's more money than he was making being retired. And really all he had, to, you know, imagine getting a job where your job is to tell people stories of what job you used to do. <laughs> That's literally your job. Your job is to tell every person over the age of 60 who wants to wear his pants way the hell up here would love for someone to pay him $5,000 a month to sit around and start every other sentence with, well, you know, in my day. <laughs> There's two central techniques in product sashimi. Um, that actually sounds more like a sales pitch than I expected, but uh, really I found that there are sort of two key techniques that if you work on those, the rest are just details. The rest are things that you sort of pick up by experience. And there's little bits and pieces all over the place. And by no means are either of these two techniques my invention. In fact, I freely admit that none of this is my invention. The only, the only innovation, if you can even call it that, is to move here instead of going here than here. Really that's the only thing that I bring to this is my observations after 10 years is that going in this direction simply creates too much friction and too many problems. That's why I prefer to go here. But the technique of how we go from a nebulous product idea to feature areas is the one that in my now 12 years of working in agile software development and 10 years in trying to teach other people how to do it is the single most powerful thing anyone ever taught me. And it happened by accident, as most great discoveries have done over the centuries. I was working for a team in, of all places, West Des Moines, Iowa. You don't want to know where that is. It is the Midwestern part of the US. It is flat as a pancake. In fact, I had never seen so much lightning in my life. I was out in an electrical storm and I swear there was lightning every 20 seconds. I had never seen anything like it because of course there's nothing to block the view. And I was working for the first time with a not-for-profit organization. I'd never had this experience before of we have to spend the money. Right? Every other place I've went, it's always, we want to save money, we want to save money. No, this was the one place that has to spend the money by law. They're not allowed to hoard money. Because then they would be classified as for profit and they would have to start paying taxes, whatever. Now, the organization that I worked with, their job was to provide uh, loans for university students. 
Because the United States is still a backwater country that thinks that people should pay for a university education. The idiots. We Canadians are slowly figuring out that that's a stupid idea. So their job is to arrange loans for people who want to go to college and university. Now, I had arranged a two-week engagement with these folks, and it was a lot of fun. They were a great group. I got to work with 12 really good people, and what we did was the first week was training, and then slowly the training would be replaced with actually building the first part of their system. And my hope was at the end of two weeks, I would have showed them a bunch of stuff, they would have actually started doing it, and then they would be fine without me. Now, it just so happens that this same company had been talking with Chet Hendrickson. Who here in the room knows who Chet Hendrickson is? That is a real shame. Chet Hendrickson was one of the programmers on the first Extreme Programming Project. Chet, so uh, there's an old saying in, in the Extreme Programming world called, it's Chet's fault. The idea is when you see people arguing about a problem and they're starting to blame each other, you just say, it's Chet's fault, can we move on? This came from an actual fight on that first team. And after 10 or 15 minutes of them arguing about what happened, Chet wrote on a card, it's my fault, slammed it in the middle of the table, and said, can we now fix the problem? Right? It's a reminder to people that when something bad happens, yes, it's natural to want to blame somebody else, but ultimately we have to solve the problem. Let's solve the problem first and yell at the person who created it later. Don't worry, we'll all remember who to yell at. So Chet is one of these little wizard kind of guys. He just, it's amazing what he knows. And he's also a short guy from the southern part of the US, actually one of the most northern mo most parts of the southern part of the US, which means he has this neat little accent which I have fun imitating. And so Chet was, they had talked to him about this job and they had talked to me and for some stupid reason they hired me instead of him. And so he and I were talking, and he asked, is it okay if I come down and visit you guys for a day? Perfect. If he wants to volunteer to fly down and spend a day with us, who am I to say no? I asked the client. The client agreed. So on a Thursday, after, uh, Thursday morning, Chet showed up. Hey, how are you doing? Blah, blah, blah. In the afternoon, we had scheduled uh, a meeting for going through their huge backlog of stories and helping them estimate them. Back when I thought estimating stories was a good idea. And so we had, of course they had a spreadsheet, as you would expect, with 191 stories and we were going to estimate them all. No problem! So we said just get us a flip chart and some post-it pa post paper, get us the key people and we'll crank it through and it'll be fine, it'll take a couple of hours because it's a lot of stories, but we'll get through it. I did not expect what happened next. I walked into the meeting room and it was kind of like this. There was a huge conference table in the center. At the front was the stuff that I asked for and they had the spreadsheet was already up on the screen, because of course that's always convenient. But in the back of the room were 40 other people sitting in chairs. It looked like almost all of them were sitting like this, getting ready to take notes. Like they're going to go see what the big ass consultant has to say. Let's see if this guy's any good. <laughs> I did not expect him to be there. So naturally I got a bit nervous. Because it's one thing to say, no problem, and then if there's only 12 people in the room and we're all in it together, if it turns out to be harder than we thought, it's just among us and we're all trying to help each other and it happens. But when there are 40 people in the back who are expecting miracles and you don't know whether you can provide them, uh, that's a little bit different. So the meeting started. And I, stupidly, said, let's draw the first screen on this flip chart and then we'll go through and we'll see sort of how many variations there are and that'll give us some idea how big this thing is. So I started to do that and we're discussing about, you know, well, how many different ways can we fill this thing in? Are there 12, there's 12 different values? Maybe there's 10 and 14 and so on. And it just kept going like this for about 20 minutes. 
After 20 minutes, we had estimated two of the 191 stories that they had on their list. And Chet was sitting right about there, quiet, just watching what's going on. The meeting was scheduled to last for 90 minutes. We had spent 20 minutes. We estimated two stories. I don't know about you, but my arithmetic tells me that we were going to be about 182 stories short. And that at that pace, if we met for two hours every day, we might finish in three months. We haven't even built any of it yet. This is not going to work. So Chet, very helpfully, just kind of said, uh, guys, uh, I see y'all are having some problems up there. Um, I've got an idea. Can I help? <laughs> I'm sweating, right, from just how bad this is going. You know how you're in the middle of some kind of a performance or in the middle of some kind of work and people are watching you and you know it's going horribly wrong and they know it's going horribly wrong and there's nothing you can do about it? And all you want is for someone to raise their hand and say, can I please take over? Yes, I don't even, if I don't even know who you are, please come up here and figure this shit out because I have no idea what I'm doing. So Chet came up and said, you know, I think, I think we're just getting a little bit bogged down with all these details. Let's, let, let's take a step back for a moment and see if we can think about this another way. And then he looked directly at one of the people on the team and he said, what does this system do? Yeah, it kind of sounded like that, like, I didn't, like they didn't understand the question. And so they started to tell him something. And he said, no, 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 no. What does this system do? And he just kept repeating the question with emphasis on different words. And after about five or six minutes, he finally got someone to tell him what the system does. Now remember that the company approves loan applications for college and university students. We all know that. So if I asked any of you, what does the system do, I'll bet you you could think of approves loan applications for college and university students. So when he finally got someone to say that, then the next question was, what's the output of this system? What's supposed so then he drew this big cloud and he said, what's the output of this system? And again, it took like 10 minutes and 12 people had to confer with each other and they'd ask for their friends. And finally, they got them to, he got them to say that what came out the other end of the system was money, a check. Because, you know, in North America, we still use checks. I know, we're stupid. So what comes out the other end is a check. I know we use checks, but I'm at least going to write it the proper way. There's actually some benefit in distinguishing between this kind of check and the kind of check you pay with. So, because believe me, if I'm getting one, I want to know which one am I getting. <laughs> so he said, fine. What we get out is a check. The check helps pay for the education. Kind of makes sense to me. What's the input to the system? By now, I think they started to get an idea what his game was. And it only took like three minutes for them to say, applications. So there's some kind of system for getting applications into the system. And what came out the other end were checks to pay for that person's education. He said, great. So here we have our system. Applications come in. Checks go out. Sounds great. And then he got in the middle of the room and he said, I'm a loan application. I want to be a check. Try to stop me. <laughs> And he waited. And it took like two or three minutes, because of course they reacted kind of like you, like what the hell did he just say? <laughs> and I, I know it wasn't an accent problem, because yes, they're from the Midwest and he's from Kentucky, but they're still all Americans, they understand each other. <laughs> I'm a loan application, I want to be a check, try to stop me. And finally someone in the back said, I don't believe you're really a student. He said, oh, so sometimes you get loan applications from people who really aren't qualified to go to college? Like they use somebody else's name or uh, they don't have a high school diploma or something like that? And the person said, yes. So he said, okay, so there's some part of the system, let's put it here, 
verify student identity. So you have some third party system there you go and you say, hey, here are some people, can you tell me if they're real? Yes, that's how it works. He said, all right. I'm a loan application from a real person. I want to be a check. Try to stop me. Quicker this time, somebody else said, your credit score is not good enough. And if your credit score is not good enough, then we can't, we can't find anyone to underwrite the loan. So okay, so how do you check for someone's credit? So again, there's this third party system and we send them uh, information about the applicant. They send us back credit information and then we have some rules that decide if the credit score is high enough. Okay, credit check. Could you start with CK? I think you can anticipate where we're going now, right? I'm a loan application from a real person with good enough credit. I want to be a check. Try to stop me. And he just kept doing this. And slowly but surely, they identified about nine key parts of the system that had to, were sort of the, the key areas for why you might reject a loan application that also, I think seven of the nine of them talked to outside systems and the other two were things that we were going to have to build. So at least we were going to have to build a couple of these systems and we had to build adapters, clients, to integrate these third party systems. And in about 20 minutes he got them to find sort of the nine key areas. He took them from here to here in 20 minutes. And in fact, I won't go through the rest of the story in detail, but I can tell you that before we left at the end of the two weeks, instead of 191 stories where they only had the first two estimated, we ended up about four days later with a stack of 46 cards that represented stories that were that were related to these key areas. And we sat down and the estimation, the estimation uh, process or the estimation meeting, which again, me, one of the lead programmers, and two of the lead business analysts at a table. 40 people in the back, because apparently they wanted to see what was going to happen this time that Chet's not here. And all I did was help them talk to each other. So I said, here are the 46 cards that we've been working on that are the 46 stories. Um, and then I, I went to, to uh, Cecil, who was the lead programmer, and I said, Cecil, can you look through these cards and tell me if any of them will take longer than a week? Just if you're worried that you can't finish any of these in a week, that your team can't finish it. So we were just kind of talking to the group as he's going through the cards and looking for the ones that he thinks were bigger than a week. And he handed back two of them. And I said, okay, great. Then I went to the business analyst and I said, can we split these in half? So we talked a little bit about what it would mean to do part of the story first and the rest later. We ended up with four new cards. Are any of these bigger than a week? He said, nope, we were done. We had 48 stories. None of the stories looked like it was bigger than a week. There were 52 weeks in the year. They had one year to complete the project. It looked like there was about 48 weeks of work. Probably this will be okay. Release planning is done. That took 15 minutes. So uh, just as a postscript, Chet and I went out for dinner Thursday night. Nice little steakhouse. And I asked him, where did you learn this? And he said, I don't know, I just kind of made it up. <laughs> so you're telling me that you saw me in trouble drowning, like my life was over, and in 20 minutes you just had an idea for this thing that might work? Yeah. Now it turns out that the, the technique that Chet used uh, is related to something called context diagramming. Beyond the words, I don't actually know anything about it. So you can go look up context, di context diagramming and you'll get the idea. And Jeff Patton's work on user story mapping is actually quite a bit related to this idea. 
It's a refinement of this idea. But this is the idea that I teach. And it turns out that pretty much every system falls into four or five major categories and one of those categories is an approval based system. It's actually a rejection based system. Where you have an input that wants to convert into an output and the system's job is to come up with reasons why that shouldn't happen. That the whole system is just an elaborate way of trying to reject the input becoming an output. Like any kind of approval system. So I said, now, now I had read recently, or not recently, I had read soon before that, um, this psychological study that showed that uh, if, uh, if you're at an airport and you ask someone to watch your luggage while you go to the washroom, they're usually happy to do it. But if you offer to pay them $5 to watch your bags while you go to the washroom, they're less likely to do it because they kind of feel like it's now a business transaction, like you wouldn't trust them to just do it out of the goodness of their hearts. That by offering them money, even though you think that that's actually better than offering them no money, they feel kind of cheap. They feel like, uh, like you don't, like, they, like you think they're a bad person and so that they would only do it for money. Since then, there's even been some talk about when you have a social relationship with someone and then you turn it into a business relationship by involving money, you can never go back. So be careful about st starting up a company with your friends. Um, you'll either have a great company and great friends or a shitty company and no friends. So I had read this and I thought about it, so I kind of joked and said, I, Chet, I said, Chet, you know, there's this study, blah, 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 blah. I said, would you feel offended if I gave you my rate for today? If I, <laughs> if I essentially got, let you get paid for my work today because you saved my ass out there. He said, no, wouldn't offend me at all. <laughs> so I sent him a check. <laughs> I just now realize why that's a better uh, punchline. It didn't even occur to Invest, me. stories. Independent, negotiable, valuable, estimatable, small, testable. These are the properties of a good story, at least the way it was taught many, many moons ago by people like Bill Wake and eventually Mike Cohn. That this was kind of the acronym that we used to help us know how to write a good story. Stories needed to be independent from each other. I should be able to build them in any sequence. They should be negotiable. Stories are not specifications. They are a token for conversation. They're enough so that we can remember what the hell we were talking about in that requirements meeting three months ago. Valuable in that I can show that there's somebody who wants to buy it. Estimatable, not really a word in English, but the idea that it's small enough and well understood enough that I can make a good guess as to how much it will cost. Small, because small usually means more independent and more easily estimated. It needs to be something that we can build without spending a long time, without getting lost. If you have to report progress on a story, it's too big. It's either done or not. And then testable, because we have to know if we're moving in the right direction. So if we don't understand what the expected result should be, then how in the hell are we going to know when we're done? Right? Tests are there to tell programmers when to stop. Because otherwise, programmers would just keep writing code forever. Right? So not only is the test there to make sure the programmer is walking in the right direction, but eventually a brick wall so they know when to stop. So this was the original idea. Now the independent part is the part that I care about for this purpose. Valuable too. These two, for me, are the most important parts. The rest are kind of a consequence of these two things. Independent and valuable. I know somebody wants to buy it, and I can build them in any order. When I look for the kernel, when I write the kernel example for a feature area, the idea is that by getting to the kernel, all the rest of these are independent. Now, some collection of them is necessary to provide value. You might not get value from just the kernel. You might not get value even from the kernel and two others. But if you build the kernel first, if you, I would say, if you identify the kernel first, and then you identify these other variations, and because these variations are independent of each other, it gives you the best chance to say 
hey, you know what? If we build the kernel, and this one, and this one, and this one, I've got somebody who wants to pay us 75,000 euro for it. Let's build that now. How long will that take? Three weeks? Awesome. That's enough money that we can keep the doors open for four more months. So really the goal here in moving from feature areas to examples is not only to have examples that we can use to guide development, but also that we can have, uh, find the kernel example, the thing that we should build first. And if we build that first, then we can build the rest in any sequence. And that maximizes our flexibility. It maximizes our ability to change the plan when constraints change. It maximizes our ability to get high value for low cost. It was the original idea behind stories. It's just at a finer grain. Now, of course, the big question is how the hell do we get there? Now, uh, how to write an example is wrapped up in how to get to the kernel. Now, I'm going to assume, in fact, I'm not going to assume, now I'm going to ask, how many of us in the room, most of our professional time is writing code? Okay, so now, for the rest of you, how many, you know, most of my professional time is spent testing software? Very few. Most of my time is spent Doing business analysty kind of stuff, writing specifications, writing stories. What the hell do the rest of you people do? Count money. <laughs> Count money. That's always good. <laughs> All right. So, how how many people count money? <laughs> I like those people. <laughs> in 3M, in 3M, if you have a good idea and can write a good and can write a good business plan and get a project started, they give you an accountant. That's how serious they are about making money. They actually give you, there's an accountant on every project. That's the way I think it should be done. So, because a lot of you are programmers or testers, um, that a lot of you probably think, like to think in terms of tests. If you don't, you will as you practice more test-driven development. An example is a test, but written in business language. Now, one of the things that makes writing examples a bit tricky is that programmers have a tendency to focus on the details. Maybe they're not a very good judge of which details are important and which ones aren't. And business people, especially if you don't have 3 million euro in insurance. So, the programmer's job also is to talk about what's possible. Right? Customers can be very good at saying, wouldn't it be great if software did this? And then the programmer can come along and say, well, you know, that's an NP hard problem. We actually don't know how to do that in the allowable, in the foreseeable age of the universe. So that's probably not going to make a lot of money because that computation is ever going to end. Or, you know, given the technologies that we have available, that's really going to cost more money than you could possibly generate in value. And the testers are there to help us essentially avoid making stupid mistakes and to point out things that we forgot. To look for the holes in our ideas, to look for the holes in our reasoning, and to try to break things. So all three of these people together are really important in building and writing examples. When I teach product sashimi as a course, I usually like to at least um, uh, to encourage a business person and a technical person, either a programmer or a tester, to come to the course together. And I will actually sell pair tickets to get two from the same team to come and work together because that's really what this is all about, is helping find ways for programmers and, te uh, for programmers and customers especially, testers as well, to work together. All three of them are, I think, an important part of writing good examples. Right? These guys know what they want with some help. These guys know what's possible, and these guys stop the other two from making too many mistakes. So what does an example look like? Well, it looks kind of like a test. A test has uh, a context, an action, and a result. So in one of the really simple uh, examples that I like to use, and uh, I don't know how well this works here in Estonia, but we'll try is the online bill payment feature uh, of a banking system. So we're 
building an online, we're building some online banking software and one of the things of course that we want to do is to allow people to pay their bills online. So what is a simple example of paying a bill online? It doesn't have to be the simplest, but a simple one. Let me tell you kind of how it works in North America. Uh, this worked everywhere except in Iceland where apparently they have a central company where all the companies will send their bills to this one central place so all, all your bills are in one place and you just pay them all. Not the way it works where I come from. Where I come from, unfortunately you still get paper bills in the mail from about 20% of the companies that you deal with. You go into the bill payment system and let's say it's the first time that I'm paying this bill. The first thing I have to do is tell my bank I would like to pay this new cell phone bill, so I look for the company, Rogers Wireless, and I find them. And then it says, please enter an account number. So I look on my bill for an account number. There it is, and I type it in. Now that I've registered someone to pay a bill to, then I can press the pay these people now button. And I'll get a little form that says, which account would you like to pay from? Okay, let me choose my checking account. When would you like to pay the bill? Let's see, it's due April 3rd, so March 31st. Usually takes two or three days. How much would you like to pay? Well, how about all of it? $123.18. Boom. So then it says, I'm going to pay Rogers Wireless from your checking account for $123.18 on March 31st, 2012. Are you sure? Yes. Then it says, there you go, here's a confirmation number. If there's any problem, tell us this confirmation number. The money should get there, let's hope it does. Okay. <laughs> so that's a simple scenario of paying a bill online. I won't bother writing it down, but that was the test. Right? So what were the givens? What, were the, 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 what was the context of the scenario? Well, what was given was, I'm, an, I'm a logged in customer of the bank, right? Because that wasn't part of my scenario. So we assume that I'm already logged in. We assume that I have a checking account. So that's, account, that's an account from which we can pay a bill. We assume that I haven't already paid Rogers Wireless on this account before, so I don't already have them registered as someone to whom I can pay money. All right, so what were the steps? It's like a script. So then we can say, okay, well, the first thing I did was say I need to pay someone new. So there should be a button somewhere or some way of saying I want to pay someone new. Here's a key point. I don't want to talk about pushing buttons. I don't want to talk about user interfaces. I don't want to talk about controls, HTML, any of that kind of crap. I want to say something like Joe, who's the user, Joe says, this is the way I like to do it, Joe says, I need to pay somebody new. However that translates into the user experience is a detail left to the programmers and the UX folks. Joe says, I need to pay someone new. Joe sees a place to enter that information. Joe says, I want to pay Rogers Wireless account 13741261. Another part of examples is they need to be concrete. It's important for an example to be concrete, to provide specific values. Why? Because when we talk about concrete values, we tend to get into more details. We tend to notice more problems. We tend to notice more details. Now's a good time to deal with that. Oh shit, what about this case? Okay, well let's write it down in the margin, get it out of our head, and get back to the te to the test we were, the scenario we were writing. So, we do this whole thing of, you know, Joe says I need to pay someone new. Joe sees a place where he can enter the information. Joe says, I want to pay Rogers Wireless, account number 13174121216. Joe, and so then Joe says, put them in my list. Then the next step, Joe says, I want to pay those, I want to pay those people. So that implies that there's a way for me not to go back to the list, find them again and choose them, but maybe after I've just added them, there should be something that allows me to say, pay these people now. Joe says, pay, the, you know, pay these people $123.18 on March 31st. Joe sees, I'm planning to do this for you. Is this what you want? 
Joe says yes. Joe sees that the payment is going to be made and sees the confirmation number 6XQ13. And that's it. So what's important about this is that it's a, really, it's a relatively simple to understand script. It's concrete, meaning that we're dealing with specific values. And that we want to separate the givens, which is the context. This is one pattern that's becoming more popular, given when then. The idea that you provide the context, you describe the actions, and then you describe the results that should happen from those actions. So it's just like a test. The difference is we try not to make references to the specific UI the way it's going to be built. We try to come up with what I like to call an abstract UI, because I'm a programmer and I like those words. But really what we're trying to talk about is how does the user communicate with the system? And one principle I like to use, or one simple technique, is pretend it's not a computer system. If I were telling a person to do this, so it's 1958, I walk into a bank and I want to pay my phone bill. And I have to tell the teller at the bank what I want to do. How would that conversation go? That's probably a good model for how to create a computer system to do it. Surprising, but it works. So we want the examples to read like a script. We want them to be concrete. It's also good to use personas. Don't say the user and the system. Who is the user? What's he like? What is he trying to achieve? Personas has become a huge part of user-centered design and has become more and more a big part of user experience architecture in agile software development. The idea that we don't just have names, but we have names and backgrounds and ideas and goals because different people will have different goals working in the system. And there's a bunch of great stuff out there to read on personas and user-centered design. Go have at it. It's fantastic stuff. Now the technique, after you write, so the, the, the real technique involved here, and this is where I'm probably going to have to end, the, te the technique that I use to get to the kernel is called contract, then expand. By any chance, does anyone in the room get that reference? Bruce Lee, enter the dragon, no? When my opponent expands, I contract, when he contracts, I expand. No? All right, you all have to go find a copy of Enter the Dragon, 1973, Bruce Lee, classic film, and watch it even just for that one speech. It's actually quite nice. Now, contract and expand is three steps. The first step we just did. The first step is write any scenario. It doesn't have to be the most interesting. It doesn't have to be the simplest. It doesn't have to be the most useful. It just has to be any. Pick any scenario of how it would be to use that feature area and write it in full detail as a script with personas, with concrete information. In the process of doing that, you're going to say, oh shit, I forgot about, don't worry about that, write it in the margin, get it out of your head and get back to what you were doing. After you've written out one concrete uh, scenario, then the next step is to contract. In the contract phase, your job is to try to take extra details out of the scenario. What you're doing is you're making it easier for the system and harder for the user. Almost every interesting conversation between a user and the system includes some things that the system will do on your behalf. We strip all that stuff away. What is the worst user interface? Not in the sense of complicated, but in the sense of not helpful. So, in the case of an online bill payment, you can be damn sure that somewhere in the background, these systems will convert the name Rogers Wireless into some ridiculous string of numbers that represents that company. What if you had to type that number in and get it right? In fact, what if the entire form was just, here's the company ID, here's the account, here's how much you want to pay, do it now. And that's the whole form. Why do you need the account? Why do you need the account is a good question. Well, maybe you need to tell them which, where, how you're going to pay the money. But, it's entirely, but that's an excellent question. You want to ask these kinds of questions. Can I remove that detail? Can I remove that detail? Can I remove the, that detail? Now, the point of the, con, of the contract phase is not to build the world's worst system. 
The point is to figure out what is the absolute minimum that I need to tell the system to make it do its job. That's the kernel. If we built that first, maybe we don't build the UI for it, but if we built the feature part of it first, the engine part, then every other variation that we might build, we could do in any sequence. And the third phase is the expand phase. During the expand phase, we look at this kernel example and we say, wow, that's shitty. How do we make it better? So there's really two key questions that we ask in the expand phase. How do we make it better and what could go wrong? And each of those will turn into a new kind of scenario. So then you write them out. You write out a scenario for each variation and for each thing that could go wrong. And you'll, for, you'll say, oh no, I have to worry about this. Fine. Again, put it in the margin. Get back to what you're working on. All of this in the margin becomes the new variations and the new special cases, the new scenarios that you need to, to write. Now, you don't have to write them all now, unless, of course, you plan to build all this stuff in the next month. Then maybe you should write them all now. It might be enough just to have two or three words in the margin, copy those in and say, we need to write these examples later. But the idea is, by writing any scenario, we at least identify a bunch of these things and we make it through one concrete scenario. We at least have one concrete understanding of how uh, we're going to interact with the system. When we contract, we remove the parts, as many parts as we can, and still have a viable feature. It doesn't have to be a useful feature, it just has to be technically complete. What is the absolute minimum? In fact, in the bill payment um, example, maybe all I do is provide the company ID, the account, and push a button. And every time I push a button, I pay them a euro. So then I keep going until I paid 124 euro. Now I have a credit of 82 cents. That will be applied to the next bill. I'm not saying it's necessarily better, but we want to try those kinds of things. And then, that, as I said, that will generate a whole bunch of variations and special cases, things that could go wrong, things that could be improved, and we can write scenarios for those. These then become either new examples or tiny stories. For the stuff that we're going to build in the next two to four weeks, we write the examples now. For the rest, we just put them on the list and say we'll write these examples later. Now what we've done is we've identified a bunch of these examples, including some of the kernel. Imagine what would happen if we built the kernel of the entire application first. Let's say that took three weeks. At the end of three weeks, what we have is a complete and totally unusable system. But it's technically correct. It could be a good B2B user interface. We might be able to sell that. But what's important now is all the rest of the examples, all the rest of the variations and special cases that we identified, we can build them in any order we want. So we can go to one customer and say, hey, this is our roadmap, isn't it pretty? Which 23 things on this list will make you give us 100,000 euro? Let's figure that out. And then that's the fastest path we can get to actually realizing some cash. That cash will pay for the next few months of development, during which we can figure out the next eight things that it will take to get you four people to pay 100,000 euro each. And then that pays for more development, and so on, and so on. So that's the sense, that's the reason why I call this product sashimi. I like to go as quickly as possible to the small, thin slices that if we build them in the right order will get us to cash sooner. And that really, I think, for anyone, especially for people who are surviving the lean startup phase, I think the key question for them is, what is the shortest path to more money? And that's what I try to teach. So, by using the Chet Hendricks and the technique to go from your nebulous product idea to feature areas, and then using contract then expand to get from feature areas to examples, you can identify the parts. Instead of building this big thing and hoping people will buy it, you have a better, much better chance of building the smallest thing people could possibly buy, which generally speaking is the fastest path to more money. I'm over time, so I have to stop. Thank you.